Hello, fourth grade, and welcome to Unit 3, Week 4. Let's get started with our vocabulary for this week. Now, your first word is the word haste. When people are at, act in haste or they do something in haste, they're doing it in a hurry. So haste is a synonym for the word hurry. Your second word is the word divided. Something that's divided is separated into different parts. So if you divide uh, your toys between you and your friend, that means you're each getting an equal number of toys. If you divide a sandwich into, into halves, you cut it into two equal parts, or fourths, you cut it into four equal parts. Your next word is the word shattered. When something is shattered, that means it's broken or it's destroyed completely. You can't put it back together. So think about if you've ever seen a glass shatter, right? A glass cup or a plate, when it falls down by accident onto the floor and it breaks into lots and lots of teeny tiny pieces, we describe that as it having been shattered. Your next word is the word tension. And tension is mental or emotional strain. So what does that mean? When you feel tense, right? You're, you're, it's making you feel upset in your mind or in your feelings. So there are example sentences here say tension over slavery grew between the South and the North, right? They were, they were not agreeing, they were upset, um, they didn't see eye to eye on it. There was a lot of tension between them. There was a lot of bad feelings between them. Your next word is the word opposed. So opposed, when you oppose something, you're fighting against it. You don't want it. You're trying to resist it. You're trying to stop it. So when we're reading our stories, you're going to read about um, President Lincoln and the difference in ideas between the North and the South about slavery. And we know that the most of the white Northerners opposed Lincoln's decision to abolish slavery. So they are, um, they were opposed to his idea. The next word is the word perish. And to perish is to disappear or to vanish. Something that's completely gone perishes. So if something uh, endangered animals may perish if people do not save them. That means they'll die away forever, right? They'll be gone. Your next word is the word proclamation. A proclamation is some kind of official announcement or public announcement that's made by an important person. So think of like a president. President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. So remember a proclamation, just a fancy way of saying a speech or an announcement. An address is a formal speech. So there's the, there's the word address which is like where you would live or maybe the address of the library or the address of um, you know, your cousin's house. But the word address, when an address is a formal speech. So same spelling, a little bit different pronunciation with a different meaning. Now our spelling words this week are going to focus on plurals. So Plurals that either have an S or ES, if they ended with a Y, how we change that to an I, and you'll see this as we go through. So you have the word clams, mints, props, arches, dresses, parents, caves, glasses, hobbies, engines, couches, arrows, enemies, babies, ranches, patches, mistakes, supplies, Mosses, armies, circus, germs, spice, batteries, and compasses. Now pay attention to which words have just an S on them, which ones have an ES, and which ones have an IES. We're going to talk about that some more in a little bit. Now, beginning our notes for this week, we're going to be talking about subject verb agreement. So we're going to do that first before we get into the rest of our notes. Now, what does that mean? A verb must agree with its subject. That means that you need to be using the right form of a verb depending on the kind of subject you have. So if your subject is singular, you're going to use a specific kind of verb. If your subject is plural or your subject is the words I or you, you're going to use a different kind of that verb. So if we have a singular subject, we have an S or an ES added on to the end of our verb. So I say, Sarah walks, Omar draws, the baby watches. So all of these have a singular subject. 
Sara is one person, Omar is one person, the baby is one person. So the verb has an S or an ES attached to it, depending on which one of those you need to add. Now, if we have a plural subject, when we have a plural subject, the verb does not have any extra letters added onto it. It's just that base verb. They talk, we draw, people sing. There's no S or ES added onto the end of that. Now, the only exception to the rule is when the subject is the word I or the word you. We treat it the same way we treat a plural subject. So again, no S, no ES. I write, you read, they talk, we draw, people sing. So if it's I, you, or a plural, your verb is all by itself. If your subject is singular, and it's not I or you, then it has an S or ES added onto the end of it. Now, the next bit we're going to talk about is called, they're called linking verbs. Now, remember a verb tells you what the subject is or does. So to find the verb, you're going to ask yourself, what is the sentence tell us that the subject is or that the subject is doing? So there can be actions that you can observe, which can be your verb, or they can be feelings or actions that you can't see. And I'm going to give you some examples of those in a minute. So linking verbs are verbs that are going to connect the subject of your sentence to a noun or an adjective that's somewhere else in the sentence later on. Most of the time, the linking verbs are a different form of the word be. Now, this is different from a helping verb because it's not paired with another verb. Remember, helping verbs, you have to pair it with another verb. So, for example, if it was a helping verb, it would be am walking, I am walking. You're pairing the am with your next verb, with the main verb, which is walking. We're not talking about helping verbs right now. They're not helping the other verb in the sentence. Linking verbs are there by themselves. So, again, forms of the word be are am, is, are, was, were, be, or been. Other linking verbs that you're going to see, and these are going to show up in your book, so please pay attention to them. Other linking verbs that you're going to see are the words look, seem, appear, become, feel, grow, smell, or taste. These are all other linking verbs. So if I say I am late for the pizza party, am is my linking verb. It's relating my subject, which is I, to the noun, the pizza party. It's linking them together. So it's tying that beginning part of the sentence in with the rest of the sentence and hooking them together. She is my best friend. I do my chores every morning. I look for my mom in the crowd. She feels grumpy today. The baby appears to like apples. So you're seeing these standing alone. They are not paired with another verb. They are the only verb in there. Now, linking verbs can also show tense, so past, past, present, and future tense. So which ones show the tense? So the past tense ones are the ones was, were, or been. Those ones show you that something happened a long time ago, or it already happened. Present tense verbs are the ones that are is, am, and are. Those are telling you that something's happening right now. And your future tense will always be will be. Now. Once we've gone through the verbs, we're going to get into the last bit of your notes. And these are talking about Greek and Latin suffixes. So prefixes and suffixes, like we said before, are parts of a word, parts that are like, there are letters and little bits of letters, a few letters at a time that are added onto a base word. And they come from the word. So prefix and suffix both come from the word affix. So when you affix something, you're sticking it or you're attaching it to something. So a prefix or a suffix is attached or stuck onto a word. Prefixes are stuck onto the beginning. Suffixes, which is what we're going to focus on today, are stuck onto the end. Now, their job is to change the meaning of the word. So it'll take your base word and it'll change the meaning slightly and give it a new meaning. Now, a lot of our prefixes and suffixes come from other languages, mainly Greek and Latin languages. So the first suffix we're going to talk about 
is a suffix ism, I-S-M. Now, this suffix means the act or the state of something. So if you are receiving criticism, that means you are being criticized. Someone's telling you what you did wrong. If someone is showing a lot of optimism, they're acting or being very optimistic. They're seeing the bright side of things. They're telling you how things are going to work out great. Activism is the state of being active about something. There's something important going on and you're actively doing something about it. Now, our next suffix is Asian, A-T-I-O-N. You, you pronounce it Asian. Now, this means the action or the process of something. So, so the way something is happening. So celebration. Celebration is the act of celebrating something, right? We're having a celebration. We're happy. We're celebrating something. We're, we're having a good time. You know, it's, it's a positive event. Decoration. Decoration is the process of decorating something, right? You take something, you make it look really pretty by adding beautiful decorations to it. Now, the word irritation, the process or the act of being irritated or bothered by something. So if any of you guys have a younger sibling, every now and then we feel some irritation because of them, because maybe they knocked down our block tower or they spilled something on our favorite t-shirt or something. Your next suffix is ment, M-E-N-T. Again, this is the act or the process of something. So enjoyment, the act of being enjoyed, right? So enjoyment is a feeling when you are enjoying something, when something is making you happy. Development is the process of developing or making something, right? Something is in development. That means it's still being made. It's actively being made right now. And the last one we're going to cover today is able. Now, able, the suffix able means capable of being or able to do something. So if something is preventable, it can be prevented or stopped. If something is valuable, it's able to have value or importance. If something is predictable, it can be predicted or you can guess that it's going to happen. Sometimes when you watch a movie, you already know how the movie is going to end. The ending is very predictable because it's very obvious what's going on. Now, the suffixes ness, N-E-S-S, age, A-G-E, ment, M-E-N-T, ants, A-N-C-E, and ents, E-N-C-E, these all have a very similar meaning, and they all mean the state or the act of something. So when you see these fixed onto a word, when you see them tagged onto the end of the word, look at the root word and this meaning. Remember this meaning to figure out the meaning of the whole word. So storage, this has the A-G-E in it, is the act of storing something or putting it away. Happiness is the state of being happy, right? Something is bringing you a lot of joy. You're experiencing or you're feeling happiness. Patience is the state or the act of being patient or calm about something. Maintenance is the act of maintaining something or keeping it as is. So if you're, if you're doing maintenance on your computer, for example, right, you're cleaning it up, you're making sure all of the parts are working properly, you're maintaining it or keeping it as is in a good state. And your last example here is encouragement, has that mint um, suffix attached to it. And that's the state of encouraging someone to do something, right? You're motivating them, you're making them feel good and telling them that they can do it. So this takes us to the end of our language arts notes for this week. We're going to go ahead and jump into your story now, our first story this week is a biography. Now, a biography is a story of someone's life that's written by somebody else. So, for example, if I wrote a story, if I wrote the story of your life, that would be a biography because it's being written by somebody different. When you have a story that's written about yourself, so if I was writing my own life story, that would be called an autobiography. The prefix auto means self. So it's, it would be me writing about myself. This story, again, is a biography. So it's a story of someone's life written by a different person. Genre. Biography. Genre. Biography. Abe's Honest Words. The Life of Abraham Lincoln. By Doreen Rappaport. Illustrated by Kadir Nelson. In the slave state of Kentucky, deep in the wilderness, 
young Abraham learned to hunt for nuts and currants, and fish for trout and bass, and tend to soil and seed. He learned sorrow at age nine when his mama died, but he found great joy with a loving stepmother who encouraged him to read and learn. Abraham Lincoln is my name, and with my pen I wrote the same. I wrote in both haste and speed, and left it here for fools to read. The family moved deeper into the wilderness, to the free state of Indiana. Panther screams and prowling bears filled Abraham's nights with fear. He had just a mite of schooling, yet he loved words the way his papa, a master storyteller, did. He stuffed books inside his shirt. In between splitting wood and plowing, he stood in the field and read. He read some books so many times he knew whole parts by heart. The things I want to know are in books. My best friend is the man who'll get me a book I ain't read. Stop and check. Reread. How did Lincoln feel about reading? Reread to check your understanding. Another move to New Salem, a village in Illinois. The long, lanky boy was a man now. He ferried people and goods down the Ohio and Mississippi rivers. In between the pull of the pole and the splash of the water, he listened to hunters spin tall tales of a mighty marksman, half man, half alligator, and sailors describe giant mosquitoes that could kill a man. He heard lawyers tell how they used words to gain justice for ordinary folks. He heard preachers quote from the Bible. A house divided against itself cannot stand. He stored these different voices in his heart and wove them into his own words. The long, muddy Mississippi River brought Lincoln south to New Orleans. He walked on cobblestone paths and along canals, past flowers spilling over lacy iron balconies. He saw men and women in fancy clothes, eating fancy foods and sipping wine. French, Spanish, and English words filled his ears, but a hideous sight shattered his joy. Twelve Negroes, chained six and six together, strung together like so many fish upon a trot line, being separated forever from their childhood, their friends, their fathers, and mothers and brothers and sisters, from their wives and children, into perpetual slavery. Lincoln worked at many jobs, farmhand, store owner, postmaster, surveyor, rail splitter. Wherever, whatever, he always had a book in hand. Elocution, grammar, mathematics, biography, history, poetry, plays. Upon the subject of education, I view it as the most important subject which we as a people can be engaged in. America was growing. Farmers needed new waterways and railroads to ship their crops. Everyone needed better education. If he became a lawmaker, he could help people get these things. So he ran for the Illinois state legislature. He spoke in public squares and country stores and hayfields. I am young and unknown to many of you. I was born and have ever remained in the most humble walks of life. I have no wealthy or popular relations to recommend me. He lost the election, but people liked what he said and how he said it. He ran again. This time he won. He ran three more times and won. He became a lawyer. His clients praised honest old Abe, the lawyer who was never known to lie. He didn't like the nickname Abe, but it stuck. Resolve to be honest at all events, and if you cannot be an honest lawyer, resolve to be honest without being a lawyer. Choose some other occupation.
nearly four million black men, women, and children were enslaved in southern states. Lincoln thought slavery a great evil. If he became a United States senator, more people would hear him speak out against it. In speech after speech, he reminded people that slavery did not fit with the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. As a nation, we began to declare that all men are created equal. We now practically read it, all men are created equal, except Negroes. He lost the election. But again his words got much attention. People felt he spoke from his heart. In the next two years, tension over slavery grew between the South and North. Lincoln ran for president and spoke out against this evil practice. He won this election. But a month before he took office, seven southern states left the Union. They formed their own government with their own president. In his first inaugural address, Lincoln reminded Americans that they were one people. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. On April 12, 1861, Southern troops attacked Fort Sumter, a federal fort in South Carolina. Lincoln knew he had no choice now. The North had to fight the South to bring it back into the Union. I hold that the Union of these states is perpetual. No state can lawfully get out of the Union. Families were torn apart as husbands, fathers, and sons went off to war, many never to return. Many Northerners worried that Lincoln did not have the skills to lead the nation in this terrible time. He's too backwoods. He's unpresidential. He tells too many silly jokes. He's had too little experience in government. If I were to try to read, much less answer, all the attacks made on me, this shop might as well be closed for any other business. I do the very best I know how, the very best I can and I mean to keep doing so until the end. Lincoln believed that true liberty could not permit slavery. He decided to use his wartime powers as commander-in-chief to end slavery. In the third year of the war, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. It freed over three million black men, women, and children and called for black men to join the Union Army. In giving freedom to the slave, we assure freedom to the free. Most white Northerners opposed Lincoln's proclamation, but he stood firm. I never in my life felt more certain that I was doing right than I do in signing this paper. My whole soul is in it. The war dragged on. Lincoln grew sadder and sadder as more Americans died. He went to the Gettysburg battlefield and again reminded the nation why these men had sacrificed their lives. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. The Emancipation Proclamation had freed slaves only in the states and territories that were in rebellion. Lincoln wanted slavery ended in the entire nation. Most white lawmakers did not want this. He called them to the White House to convince them of what he knew was right. The moment came when I felt that slavery must die, that the nation might live. Finally, they agreed. In the fourth year of the war, victory seemed close for the North. But Lincoln felt no joy. Hundreds of thousands of men on both sides had died in battle. The country was deeply divided. Many Northerners wanted to punish the South for starting the war. 
Southerners were furious that the Union Army had destroyed their cities and homes and crops. Could the nation ever be one people again? In his second inaugural address, Lincoln shared his vision of how the country could heal itself. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds. The South finally surrendered. The job of healing the nation began. But Lincoln, was not there to help. An assassin's bullet ended his life. But his words were there to guide those who chose to remember. It is for us the living, rather that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Genre Speech Compare texts Read Abraham Lincoln's most famous speech. A New Birth of Freedom The Battle of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania in July 1863 was a turning point in the Civil War. Thousands of soldiers on both sides lost their lives. After the battle, a proclamation created a national cemetery there. President Lincoln came to Gettysburg on November 19, 1863, to honor the soldiers who had died. In his address, Lincoln praised their courage and asked people to honor them by working toward a new birth of freedom. At the time, reactions to his speech were mixed. It has since become one of the most famous speeches in our nation's history. The Gettysburg Address Four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war we have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives, that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Okay, so that takes us to the end of our first story and our short story. We're going to get into our reading and writing workshop now. 
And this one is also uh, another powerful story. It gives a lot of information. So we're going to listen and learn about Nelson Mandela. Weekly concept, powerful words. Essential question, how can words lead to change? Listen and learn. The man in the photograph is Nelson Mandela. He is a famous activist and statesman who fought a long battle for equality in South Africa. His words have inspired people all over the world to fight against racism and injustice. Read Mandela's words on page 204. What do you think he means? How could your words lead to change? Talk about it. Write phrases that describe how people use powerful words to create change. Then talk to a partner about Mandela's words. Our next screen here shows us our vocabulary, so you are welcome to click through this, same as always. And our short story here is going to be called Words for Change. Genre, Biography. Words for Change. The Early Years. In 1827, when Elizabeth Cady Stanton was eleven, her father said, Oh, my daughter, I wish you were a boy. Elizabeth was shattered. From that time on, she became determined to prove to her father and the whole world that women, and all people, deserve equal treatment. Elizabeth's father was a lawyer, judge, and congressman. She would listen eagerly when a woman would come see him for legal advice. But she was often disappointed. Her father could not help them because women did not have the same rights as men did under the law. Married women could not own property or vote. Elizabeth said, The tears and complaints of the women who came to my father for legal advice touched my heart and early drew my attention to the injustice and cruelty of the laws. Elizabeth began drawing lines through all the laws she opposed in her father's law books. She planned to take a pair of scissors and cut these pages out. Her father had a better idea. He told her that when she was grown up, she must get lawmakers to pass new laws. Then the unfair laws would perish and disappear. Women's lives would be changed. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her daughter Working for Change Elizabeth was as passionate about the rights of African Americans as she was about those of women. At that time, the country was divided in two by the issue of slavery. While working for reform, she met her husband, the abolitionist Henry Stanton. They were married in 1840. Elizabeth refused to use the traditional words, promise to obey, in her wedding vows. The Seneca Falls Convention Elizabeth tried to settle into the role of wife and mother. But she wanted to be an activist and work for change. She took her father's advice and wrote a proclamation. It was called the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments. Modeled after the Declaration of Independence, it stated that women should be able to vote and have the same rights as men. She presented this document in 1848 at America's first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Elizabeth and her friend, Lucretia Mott, organized this important event. In her address at the convention, Elizabeth said, Because women do feel themselves deprived of their most sacred rights, we insist that they have immediate admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of the United States. List of attendees at the convention. A winning team. Three years later, Elizabeth met Susan B. Anthony. Together, the two made an unstoppable team. Elizabeth was a passionate speaker and writer. 
Anthony was a gifted leader and organizer. In 1869, they formed the National Woman Suffrage Association. This group was dedicated to helping women gain the right to vote. Congress showed no haste or hurry to change the law. Elizabeth toured the country. She spoke about reforms for women and a women's right to vote. She did not care if her speeches caused tension and made some people angry. She believed in her cause. Victory at last. Elizabeth Cady Stanton never got to cast a vote before she died on October 26, 1902. Yet her bold words had a lasting impact. Women finally gained the right to vote on August 18, 1920, when the 19th Amendment was ratified. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's passion for equal rights paved the way for future women's lives to be changed forever. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton Make Connections Talk about how Elizabeth Cady Stanton helped women gain the right to vote. Think about a time when you disagreed with something or wanted to change something. What did you say to try to change it? Reread. When you read an informational text, you will often come across new facts and ideas that you would like to remember. As you read Words for Change, stop and reread key sections to help you understand and remember the information. Find text evidence. You may not be sure how the Seneca Falls Convention came about. Reread page 210 of Words for Change to find out. The Seneca Falls Convention. Elizabeth tried to settle into the role of wife and mother. But she wanted to be an activist and work for change. She took her father's advice and wrote a proclamation. It was called the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments. Modeled after the Declaration of Independence, it stated that women should be able to vote and have the same rights as men. She presented this document in 1848 at America's first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York. Elizabeth and her friend Lucretia Mott organized this important event. When I reread, I learn that Elizabeth and Lucretia organized this important event. From this text evidence, I can infer that Elizabeth and Lucretia were determined women who got things done. Author's Point of View The author's point of view is his or her position or attitude about the topic of the selection. Looking closely at the reasons and evidence presented in the text will help you figure out how the author feels about the topic. Find text evidence. When I reread page 210 of Words for Change, I can look for details that show how the author feels about Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her fight for women's rights. Graphic Organizer Detail Elizabeth thought the laws were cruel and unjust to women. Detail Elizabeth's Declaration of Rights and Sentiments declared that women should have the right to vote. Biography Words for Change is a biography. A biography is the story of a real person's life written by another person. Usually presents events in chronological order. May include text features such as primary sources. Find text evidence. Words for Change is a biography. It tells about an important, actual person, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. It includes primary sources. Text feature. Captions. Captions give additional information about photographs and text features. Primary source. Primary sources are original works such as diaries, letters, or documents created at the time of the event.
Latin and Greek suffixes. A suffix is a word part added to the end of a word to change its meaning. Some suffixes come from Latin, such as meant, the act or process of, able, capable of. Other suffixes come from Greek, such as ist, one who has a profession. Find text evidence. As I read page 209 of Words for Change, I am not sure what treatment means. I know the base word treat means behave towards. The suffix meant means the act or process of. From that time on, she became determined to prove to her father and the whole world that women, and all people, deserve equal treatment. Your turn. Use your knowledge of suffixes to find the meanings of the following words in Words for Change. Activist, page 210. Unstoppable, page 211. Amendment, page 211. Okay, that takes us through to the end of our notes for this week, fourth grade. If you have any questions, definitely let me know. Otherwise, I hope you have an amazing week. Take care. Bye-bye.